Good morning. We're here today with Mr. John William Hoke, Jr. He prefers to be addressed as Jack, and that's the way we'll refer to him today during this interview. We're going to talk to him about his career in the United States Navy, which spanned nearly a decade, involved service in two wars, and that career in the service coincided with the spread of communism and the beginning of the Cold War. So we're going to hear of some of his experiences, which, which are quite interesting, and we're going to share a lot of his memories. How are you this morning, Jack? I'm fine. You enjoying this good fall weather? Absolutely. Good. I'd like to start off by uh, talking a little bit about your background and discussing some of your, some of your biography. Where were you born? Uh, in Charleroi, Pennsylvania. Yes. In 1927, so, October the 6th. So you just celebrated a birthday here, 80 years old. Well, congratulations. That's a milestone. That's great. Thank you. Uh, what did your parents do? My father worked at Corning Glass Works in Charleroi. Oh, yeah. And your mom was a house? And my mom was a housekeeper. That's, well, that, was a, that, that was and is a very important job, right? Yes, it was. That's true. Now, did you have any siblings? We have seven children. Seven? Where'd you rank in that? Oh, I take that back. We have four children. We have seven grandchildren. Oh, I'm that's sorry. your children. You have four children. Yes. Your mom and dad. How many children did they have? I was Do you have any brothers and sisters? I was the only child. Oh, okay. So you got all the attention. No, I got all the that's attention. That's nice. Spoiled uh, brat. Oh, I doubt that. Uh, it didn't sound, doesn't sound like a spoiled brat from what I'm reading here. So uh, you grew up in Charleroi? Yes. You, and your dad worked in, did you have any and jobs before uh, you went into the service? Well, when I, as immediately when I got out of high school, I went to, uh, worked on the Pennsylvania Railroad in Newell for a very short time, and then I joined the Navy. You graduated from Charleroi High School? Charleroi High School. And what year would that have been? In uh, 1945. 45. Mm -hmm. Okay, and let's talk about then joining, uh, before we get to joining the Navy, uh, we'll want to talk about what prompted you to join the Navy, but you were then a teenager, uh, in high school during World War II. Yes. So I'd like to ask you, because this is a good opportunity for us to get some information about what it was like on the home front during World War II. Can, do you have any remembrances of uh, what it was like growing up and going to school during the war? Well, we can, can remember the rationing of all the food and the sugar and uh, things that were hard to get, and gasoline, of course. And um, I was a scout. Yeah, you were a Boy Scout. I was a Boy and Scout. An, and then an Eagle Scout. And which eventually was an Eagle Scout. Certainly an in achievement, 1944. too. 1944. Yeah. Now, as, as a result of being a scout or just as a young man living during that time, did you participate in any of any kind of service activities on the home front? I, I know they had scrap drives and things like yes, that. Yes, we had scrap drives for steel. Uh huh and papers, and uh, we also uh, went to the borough building uh, and um, monitored the telephones to, uh, if there was an air raid drill, we'd call the steel mills and uh, get everybody to shut their lights off in the different businesses. Jeez, you had a role to play even before you went into the service. Yeah, sort of. Yeah. Well, your, your father, was. Uh, did he go into the service? Was no, he, he, he was never in the service. Okay, he was probably because of his age and yeah. because of the family situation. Right. Did he have any, were there any family members, any uncles or anybody else that you had in uh, the service that, that you corresponded no, with? No, no. I had a cousin that was in the Navy, mm -hmm. and he was an aviation ordinance man, and I triggered the thoughts of him and eventually became an aviation okay. organist. I was wondering what the connection was, that, that, that yes. deciding to go in, into that role. He was in the South Pacific okay. and flew in DBM, DBM planes. Uh -huh. uh, they were float planes. Yes. And you, did you correspond with him? Did you? Did you yes. Write? So he was giving you some idea of what was yes. going on. Yes. That made you want to enlist? I, I'm sure I was destined to become a sailor because of him. That's interesting. Now, so then you just assumed you were going to go into the service. Oh, absolutely. 
we planned that. You and your buddy? My buddy was a, uh, he also became an Eagle Scout, but we had, he had planned to be a pilot and I was gonna be his gunner. <laughs> and it turned out that he, uh, he went to flight school for the Navy and he crashed a plane, he wasn't hurt, but he was out of being a pilot. Uncle Sam had different plans. Though. They had different he used plans. Used his talents in a different way. But you were able to still work around the, the airplanes. Yes. In, in, in to, in to some extent. Let's t go before we get into that because I do want to hear that story. Let's back up a little bit now. You've graduated from high school. Mm -hmm. You've had this in your mind that as soon as you turn 18, you're going to go into the service. Yes. So October comes around. You turn 18. Did you go right down and enlist? Then? Yes. And you listed in the Shawleroy? Just a few days after I was 18. Uh, Shawleroy had a, a recruiting office I, and the draft office. We used to be, in my day, the draft office was there, too. It was no, the, it was in the post office, yeah. Okay. All right. That's where the Navy recruiter was. Okay. How'd your mom feel about you going into the Well, city? she couldn't do anything about it after I was 18. I know, but how mothers are. Did she, did she and, give any uh, misgivings at all? I, I'm sure she did didn't tell you but uh, yeah we, we didn't have many discussions about it it was cut and dried I was going in the Navy and you did and I did did you did you correspond and keep in touch with them pretty oh, much absolutely that's great yes that's good I, I enlisted as an air crewman a combat air crewman yes and the, the plan was to go to uh, uh, the um, Boot camp was in Memphis, Tennessee. It was a special boot camp just for combat air crewmen. It wasn't great late like everybody else went. And, uh, and then I went to aviation ordnance school and a, um, an aviation training school down in Florida. And um, Later, I went to Explosive Ordnance Disposal School in Indian Head, Maryland. And there I became a deep sea diver with the hard hat. Suit weighed 185 pounds and that I seems, weighed 125. That seems to me a jump. Uh, now, your buddy, you and your buddy didn't get to go through all this training together. He went someplace no. else to learn to be a pilot. Were That's you, right. Were you ever reunited at all during your career in the service? Uh, no, he eventually uh, uh, went to um, uh, training school to be a priest. Is that right? And that's how he wound up. He wound up in the Air Force as a, as a chaplain. As a priest. And he uh, retired from the Air Force. And um, Have you been able to keep in touch with him? He at lives all? down in Florida. That's yes, nice. we do keep in touch. That's very good. Uh, that's something to share. He was my best friend. Yeah, that's good. That's 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 nice to hear that story. Um, so, you went in and, and, and you said you you learned how to maintain the weaponry of the bombs on these on these aircraft, correct? Yes. Mm -hmm. And then you learned about the explosives in case things go wrong with the bombs. You learned how well, to uh, the explosive ordnance disposal was uh, any bomb or or any explosive ordnance from any country in the world, we were trained to disarm it or dispose of it. So this was on top of, of your of your training? Of the aviation ordinance. Yes, yeah, so this yes. was another specialization. Yes. Okay, so that at least somewhat stays together, bombs and ordnance. And yes. How in the world did you make this jump to become a diver? Well, the, you had to dispose of torpedoes and explosive uh, ordnance underwater. I get it. So we had to be a diver to do that. And you volunteered for this? Oh, yes. I got an extra 10 bucks a month for being bucks. that. 10 bucks, okay, so wow, it was the big money. Yeah. <laughs> it made you want to do it. That's when the back in the days when uh, you were young and, and, and yeah. uh, invincible, right? I got uh, $10 a month for being explosive ordnance disposal man and five dollars a month extra for being a diver. So I got 15 bucks more than anybody else. What was else. the base pay? Yep. What was the base pay? Uh, I can't really remember at that time. It was probably a uh, hundred and hundred dollars maybe. I was just going to say it probably wasn't very much a month. Probably mm -hmm. you know three four bucks a day. Well when I went in the Navy my first pay was twenty four dollars. Right. 
so fifteen dollars was a big chunk of change on top of it. Did you save us money yourself, or were, did you send any home? I was sending it home. That's the mm -hmm. typical of the stories we've mm -hmm. heard from a lot of a lot of uh, men at that time that looked at this as a way of helping their families. I, I flew home a lot too to uh, visit the family was when I could. The advantage of being around the airplanes. Yeah. Like, flew with the Navy. Yeah. Um, I guess that was it. So you got extra money and free transportation home. Yeah. Well, you had it made, except for the <laughs> fact that the bombs might blow up. <laughs> yeah. So it's now turned over into 40, 46, huh? Yes. Okay. And, and where, where, where were you stationed all during this time? I've got, we, I know in my mind I have, and I'm sure the people that are watching the interview have some sense of what your training was, where were you stationed? Started out in Tennessee well, and then? Started in Tennessee and then I went to Jacksonville, Florida okay. to the two aviation schools and then to Virginia Beach, Virginia, a uh, little auxiliary air station. Another tough duty, huh? Yeah, that was, yeah, that was really tough. <laughs> and um, there we had a, uh, we were in charge of all the ordnance on the base the uh, small arms and uh, skeet shooting for the pilots. Is that right? Uh, that was the part of the training, though, yes. skeet shooting, yes. Mm -hmm. and, um, and then I went to uh, the uh, Explosive Ordnance Disposal School in Indian Head, Maryland, and that was six months. And then I went back to Virginia Beach again, and then I went to Atlantic City Naval Air Station. I was in a composite squadron there until it was time for me to be discharged in 1949. Okay, uh, where did they train you to do the diving? At the Explosive Ordnance Disposal School. All that was done then on in, site, it was all part yes. of it. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, I'm joking, uh, we're both joking about the easy duty in Virginia Beach, but um, any time you're going to have to deal with bombs, they, or it's an ordinance, it could yeah. blow up anywhere mm -hmm. and, and and so uh, I don't want anybody to think this wasn't really something that you need to be precautious about uh, right. and, and uh, you're being good natured about it. Did you ever have to uh, disarm any ordinance underwater? Did you, I know you trained, but were you ever yeah, called upon no, to do I it? I never was called upon to do it. By, by then the war was, I know technically the, the service doesn't uh, count the wars ending until 1946, yeah. but most of the shooting and, and all of the hostilities in World War II were over That's by right. the time that uh, you got into the service yeah. and went through your training. So certainly mm -hmm. couldn't call it peacetime, though, because... They, uh, they occasionally found explosive ordnance. Imagine. Uh, yeah. Even they found, when they were sweeping mines in the North Sea, they found mines that were floating around that were from World War I and they still had six-tenths of a volt of, on the batteries, which would have been enough to fire them. To detonate. So, so the stuff can be around a long time. I think every so often you read about some of the stuff that they find from World yeah. War II, right. uh, let alone the mines and things that are being put out now, which are yeah. probably designed to last even longer. Right. So you spent your, your uh, first hitch in the Navy then mm -hmm. uh, training to do all of these kinds of things. Yes. And so became kind of a specialized guy. Right. But then thought that your time was up, and that was 49, 49. if I remember. So you get out of the service in 1949. Yes. With the intention of doing what? What were you planning well, on doing? Well, I, um, on the GI Bill, I found that there was a, a gunsmith school in Pittsburgh, and which wouldn't start for six more months. And uh, they suggested that I uh, take their engraving school where they were teaching uh, the art of hand engraving and go through that and then it would be time to start the gunsmith school. Okay. So we did that, started the gunsmith school, and then along came the Korean War and I got called back in the Navy. It was all that training. September. That was all that training they put you yeah. through. They wanted to get their money's worth, huh? Yeah, they're good. <laughs> but I was an inactive reserve, and we were not to be called unless there was an all-out war. 
and the Korean War really wasn't a war, it was, they called it a conflict. So I was kind of bitter about getting called back in the Navy. Let's talk about what was going on with you in your personal life that made well, you bitter or upset. Uh, so you're going to school, and now did you move back home? Were you living back in Yes, I was living back at home. You're traveling in the Pittsburgh Traveling in the Pittsburgh, Charlotte, Pittsburgh driving, taking every day. Bus. Yeah, driving. Okay, so you're going back and forth. Uh, you planning on settling down? Uh, well, I, I had a girlfriend. Her name was Dorothy Logan. She was going to California College at the time to okay. be a teacher. Yeah. And um, we were planning to get married, but we hadn't set any dates. And uh, after I got to San Diego, when they called me back in, I called her and we discussed the possibility of getting married, and we decided to get married in January of 1951. So I flew home from San Diego. We got married and drove back out to San Diego, got an apartment. We were there a couple months, and we got word the ship was going to be, we were going to load the squadron on board the carrier and go to Korea. Okay. And finally did that. Okay. Uh, I want to hear a little bit more details uh, about this. Uh, you were called back ex exactly when, can you remember? Uh, uh, I was back in in September of 1950. 50, okay. So yeah, the Korean started War started in June. June. So yeah, so they didn't give, they were, they were looking around for people and yes. somehow your name came back. And, the and aviation ordnance men were hard to find at that time. That's what I said, and you were really trained in a lot of different specialties. Yes. So how old were you at the time? Well, I'd have been 21, I guess. Yeah, when you were still young enough, yeah. still in good shape. But yeah. So you were just a prime prize for those yeah. guys. So, uh, so you're sitting around and you're planning, you thought of marriage and, and settling down and raising a family in the Mon Valley and mm -hmm. being a gunsmith. I guess you had some interest in, in guns, uh, uh, particularly, uh, oh. uh, that you wanted to be a gunsmith? Uh, I just love guns, and I still do, and I still engrave them. Did you... Uh, did you do some hunting and, 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 and work with guns back here in western Pennsylvania? Oh, yes. Small game hunting and deer hunting. Oh, okay. So you were a pretty avid oh, yes. hunter. I had quite a collection. It's a little bit off the subject, but just really quickly because you have that expertise. Was it a lot different hunting back then than it is in modern Oh, time? my. There, it doesn't seem to be any small game to hunt anymore. The pheasants have died off and... Uh, there aren't many rabbits, and it just isn't as good as it used to be. Yeah, Those were the good old days. The good old days. Huh? Things were a lot different. I, I could come home and, uh, and go out in, uh, in a couple hours and get a pheasant or two, yeah. most any night. Yeah. Well, things have certainly changed there. They certainly have changed. Back to the Navy. So you get this letter, and your first in reaction, as you said, you're bitter, Well, I, upset. I I kind of was upset, yeah. I thought, well, I'd done my time. True. But uh, Did you think at all about trying to get out of it? Well, yeah, but there just wasn't any way to get out of it. Yeah. I wonder, really, how so, much time you did think about that. I figure you were they, they calling put us, you back to duty. You probably just figured. Can't do anything it. about it. Right. And they put us on a square wheel uh, cattle car and chipped us out to San Diego across the desert with no air conditioning and uh, had to sit up uh, for four days getting out there. So now you're in San Diego. Did you do any, uh, did they refresh any of your training? Did you have to do any other uh, well, training when you were there? Yeah, we, we um, prepared the aircraft and the pilots for uh, Dropping bombs. You and knew you were going to be assigned to an aircraft carrier. Yes. You oh yes. Right away. I, mean, I was that assigned was to a squadron, which was part of a uh, carrier air group. Okay. Which was planning to get on a carrier and go to Korea. So that you knew that that was what your job was going oh, to yes. be. You knew you were going to be shipped overseas this time, yes. and you knew what your duties were, and so they were just training you to do that. Yes. And in the interim, you decided to get married, and so your your future wife. Your, you fly back and you get married and then you you live in San Diego for yes. how long? You, what could well, have been two months, I think. No, well, it wasn't very yeah, long. January, February, March, April, three months. Okay, and then you get word to ship out. 
Yes. And what, what ship well, were you? I went on the Bonham Richard. Okay. CV-31. And the Bonham Richard is a aircraft? An Essex-class carrier. And can you tell me what that means, Essex-class? Well, the Small, Essex, big, or they the, built quite a number of carriers on the Essex uh, frame. Okay. They were exactly the same. Okay. And um, uh, I can't think of what I was going to say. Well, that's okay. I, I was asking, because to put it in the frame of reference, I know today these modern mega oh, yes. things. But it, was this a really large ship? Because I know well, we had board. about three thousand members on the 3, uh, carrier. People. Okay, it's a good sized carrier. Okay, how many planes? Roughly. Probably two hundred, uh, two hundred and fifty. And they were all the same kind of plane. You started no. to tell me, and I interrupted oh, you there. Okay, I, on I the, um, it was very dangerous on the flight deck at that time because all the planes weren't the same type. They weren't uh -huh. all propeller planes as they were on World War II. Sure. So, uh, and you had to you, work on all different types of planes. You worked on this flight deck. You had to be extremely careful about your, your location and what you were doing because yes. the jet planes, you never walk behind them, and the propeller planes, you never walk in front of them. And um, the uh, fellows that worked on the flight deck that handled the chocks they put under the wheels of the planes to keep them from rolling. One day we were coming back from lunch from Chow, and there was blood on the deck, and we said something's happened, and apparently a young man had thrown a chalk under the wheels of the plane and, and gone straight out into the propeller from Thinking he was behind. working on a jet, not, not, con yeah. not, being, not concentrating or not remembering. Probably, so, too, there were probably a lot of distractions. What was it like on the deck of the carrier? From what I've seen, in uh, in videos, seems almost chaotic. I'm sure it's not, it but people are. It is. It was very dangerous. Uh, planes would come back with hung bombs or rockets that didn't fire, and when the uh, arresting gear would stop the plane suddenly, these things would usually fall off and hit the deck. The bombs. The bombs and the rockets. Yeah. And the rocket would skid up the deck just like shooting an arrow on the ground. Yeah. You don't know where it was going to go. And the bombs would go bump, 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 and straight off the other end of the ship. Did they ever explode? Did you hear? They it never exploded. Oh, that, that they were they were made not to explode. Okay. Uh, they were carrier safe. The fuses oh, were, right. had to be carrier safe. Yeah. So they could take a lot of beating and not go off. All we see in, in the, again, I'm referencing it from a movie because I've never actually been mm -hmm. on the deck of an aircraft carrier. Is it as loud? Is it as, is, is noisy oh. as, as it seems? Tremendous! All those engines going, and the propeller planes, and the jet engines are whining, and um, that adds to the danger. Then that adds to the danger, and also when the uh, when the jets were on the uh, catapults, they couldn't take off without being catapulted. They they couldn't fly off like the other planes, and the uh, we had a wooden deck. And it had tar in between this, the uh, deck boards, and the jets would throw such heat that it'd melt the tar. And if you were even quite a ways behind them, you'd get splattered with this hot tar. Jeez. So you had to be cautious about that. I mean, that's the kinds of things that people would not even think about. Something mm -hmm. small sounds so small like mm -hmm. that, but everybody can imagine having this flash of tar or something hit yeah. their skin. And that could be really uncomfortable or, or like you said, yeah. dangerous. How did you communicate? Well, my thought is, you know, if somebody was about to do something, I, I keep got, I have this image of that man you said that walked into the propeller. Yeah. If you saw something like that about to happen and it was so noisy, how could you communicate? You couldn't. Way? That's what I was thinking. Yeah. yeah. We wore earplugs, you know, they did give us earplugs to uh, yeah. protect your hearing. Right. But um, we had another experience uh, one morning a jet was to uh, be catapulted off. <coughs> Excuse me. Sure. <coughs> and um, he was winding up the engine, and he was shaking his head. And the man on the catapult uh, button to shoot the plane off misunderstood that he thought he was ready to go, and he wasn't. The engine wasn't running right. 
and the um, plane captain and the electrician, several men ran out in front of the wing of the plane to get up on the wing uh, to see what the problem was. And the fellow hit the button on the launch and it launched the plane and several guys were right over the side with the plane and the pilot. And some were saved and some were not. I don't recall so now. So you lost people. So we lost people this just is, through accidents. Well, see, that's one of the things that well, I, I think that these interviews bring across to a lot of people, that it's not just combat in the service that is potentially dangerous. Even the training. Even the accidents. And the day-by-day -day, uh, maintenance can have really bad consequences if, <coughs> like you said, just through uh, an mm -hmm. accident. Uh, that's another example. We're mm -hmm. talking about the Great Pennsylvania weather. That's from our uh, our, our cold spell that we had here in that, in that, in that uh, damp weather last week. Huh? That, that, yeah. 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 yeah I, and I and I think that's 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 really uh, you know the movies don't show or talk mm -hmm. about things like that. Mm -hmm. Some books and memoirs do, but I think that's what's really important to sit and talk to people that experience the day by day stuff, the things that I wouldn't have even thought to bring up. Yeah. So let's talk about how long you were on this carrier now. You got shipped over, you got called uh, up in September. You were there three months, so yes. that's around the turn of the year. Uh, so you get you get <coughs> shipped over there in well, er, early the 50. Carrier, the carrier left the uh, San Diego in May. A 52? Of 51. Oh, a 51? Mm-hmm. Okay. May of 51, and right. you were there until December of 51. In I uh, sent in North Korea. Korea. Mm -hmm. Okay. We were in Korea. Uh, <coughs> excuse me for this cold. Water. Yeah. Um, we uh, we went into Sasebo, Japan, uh, the first time, and uh, the harbor was so small. They had a uh, a British carrier in the harbor and they were having a problem with maneuvering the carrier around and they wound up the engines to to move it uh like in the bridges the bridges of tokori they had a story about the the, the uh, ad planes they tied them down on the deck and they wound up the engines to maneuver the carrier and that actually happened wow. on our carrier. Yeah, you uh, saw I think that was written into that story, but it was a different carrier yeah, sure. in yeah. the movie. Yes, yes. But that's what actually happened. They, uh, they wound up those engines to move the carrier. You wonder who came up with that idea, you yeah. know, who thought that up. But that's, that's pretty interesting. Mm -hmm. Now, when you were, they were flying combat missions off of this carrier, mm -hmm. bombing targets. In Korea. in Korea, where were you? Where were you? Where was the ship at when those combat missions were being flown? Oh, we we were in sight of Korea frequently. Okay, we were that close to the uh, shore. Sure. Uh, was there any any enemy fire back or any enemy uh, planes no. attacks back on your carrier? The only thing they worried about was possibility of the submarines. Uh huh. And we had a destroyer on both sides of us. Uh, especially on the side of Korea. Yeah. <coughs> One morning they had uh, uh, general quarters, and the planes took off with uh, depth charges on them. And when they came back, they didn't have any depth charges on them, but nothing was said about where they went. So they didn't know whether the uh, the destroyer was hit in the back portion of the ship, severely damaged. By a torpedo? By maybe a torpedo, maybe a mine. We, okay. d we never did hear ever yeah. what ever happened. Yeah. But the plane came back with no, no uh, depth charges. They dropped them maybe as a and it was no more, nothing more was said about yeah. it. Well, that's again typical of the service, mm -hmm. you know, where they uh, don't share too much information. Yeah, and right. You have to figure it out on your own. Exactly. Sometimes years afterwards, yeah. finding out the real story. So you were over there, how many months did you say? I think nine months. Nine months. 
then they just rotated that ship back? Yes. And then you came back? They had several carriers doing the same thing. Okay. Uh, there were usually three carriers operating together all the time we were there. Okay. And every fourth day they would have a replenishing ship come out with more bombs and rockets and ammunition. And uh, at one time we used 400 tons of ammunition in four days. So that was a lot of bombs thrown off that carrier. Say, yes, yeah, just in less than a week that yeah. much. So that was an awful lot of ordnance yeah. being taken off of there. Did you lose any pilots? From we lost several pilots. Shot down? Were shot down. Uh, probably the funniest story I can think of, he <coughs> was a pilot named Allard. He was from California, and uh, he <coughs> his plane was shot up, and he finally had to bail out. And he was coming down in a parachute, and there were bullets zinging past him. So he pulled out his trusty 38 Special, and he's looking down to see who he's going to shoot back at. And he cocked the hammer, and he was looking around, and all of a sudden he hit the ground. And the gun was laying there, pointed at him, and didn't fire, even though it was cocked. Yeah. And he got out of his chute, and he, the orders were, if, the, if they were shot down, to get to the highest ground to be picked up with a helicopter. So um, he uh, ran through ditches and and the, uh, the planes, the ADs were strafing these guys to keep them away from him. And he finally got to high ground, and the helicopter came in, and on the end of the hook for the helicopter, there's a heavy weight, and it's swinging back and forth, and he isn't paying attention. He's still looking to shoot somebody with his 38, and this thing bongs him right on the head. And he had a big black eye and a big bump on his head, and the <laughs> helicopter picked him up and <laughs> brought him back to the ship. Well, he could he could have used that for some good stories, huh? Yeah. He, give one if he gave him a purple heart for that. <laughs> he, he should have had I that. I was just going to say, maybe for that for that. Wound. But two weeks later, he was going down the flight deck, full power on the plane, and the engine coughed several times and went in the drink. And the ship ran over him. And then, of course, they steered away from him, and he bobbed up to the surface, and they picked him up with a helicopter. And yeah, after that, he uh, said that was enough flying for him, and they, they let him come home. I was going to say, I don't think I'd have been tempted <coughs> to go for the third time <laughs> after that one. That would have been, that would have been rough. Yeah. Um, when, the, when, the, when the carrier came, you, uh, before I, you talked to these men? I mean, you interacted with the pilots? Uh, oh, yes. Uh, because you were setting up their planes mm -hmm. and everything, so you knew them when if you lost somebody. I mean, you have a... Oh, absolutely. Oh, yeah. It's not like they're just impersonal yeah. flying away. These were your friends. These were the yes. people that you lost. So that war was coming back home to you every day, saying, I'm off the shore of Korea, but you were still getting mm -hmm. the emotional impact of what was absolutely. happening. Absolutely. Uh, sure. You came home. Then were you discharged from the service when the ship came back in? Yes, uh, within a month. Oh, okay. Well, I want to go back then and talk a little bit about your training because I cut you off uh, about this underwater uh, training to be a diver and, mm -hmm. and what are some of your impressions about that. You actually didn't use any of that during the Korean War tour, no. did you? Mm -mm. Okay. Didn't. Which was good. Uh, yeah. Yeah, and since, since the danger involved. Tell me a little bit about what you went through and what you can remember from that, uh, from the, from the training uh, of to be an underwater diver. Well, uh, to qualify, we had to be able to go down 125 feet of water. And um, there the pressure is, I think, 65 pounds per square inch all over your body. And the suit doesn't uh, keep any pressure off of you, it just keeps you dry. Supposedly. The old-fashioned suit. Yeah. yeah, big heavy rubber <coughs> suit. And uh, it was about as thick as an inner tube covered with fabric. And uh, you didn't have any feeling in your hands. You had gloves that separated your fingers like that. 
<coughs> so you didn't <coughs> you didn't have any feeling at all about what you were doing. Yeah. And they and expected you to dismantle bombs and yes. Uh, in the dark. In the dark. <laughs> We can laugh about it now, but I'm yeah. pretty sure it wasn't funny back then. So in this uh, this dive to qualify, we were in the Potomac River, and and it's very muddy down at the bottom. And we, when you hit the bottom, you sink in up to your knees in mud. And you said something about how much this suit weighed, and I forgot. Oh that. yeah, the suit weighed 185 or 190 pounds, and I weighed 125. I can see why you'd be sinking <coughs> straight into the mud. Did they have, like, a, I've seen again, I'm, I'm, I'm not experienced mm -hmm. at all as a diver, but I've seen the shoes, were they like, they looked the like they were huge, big, heavy. Yeah, the shoes, shoes were leather and they had a very heavy leather, lead sole. Okay. And they weighed 10 pounds a piece. And the belt weighed 10 pounds with lead weights on it. And the uh, helmet weighed, helmet and the breastplate weighed 85 pounds. And you weighed 120. <coughs> <laughs> Did they pick you particularly? Did they like men that were uh, thinner or, or lighter? No, no, er everybody was a big guy. Oh, okay, well. The, uh, the, dive the diving officer, they called him Bull Dorigan, and he could skip rope with the, with the, with the diving shoes on. Jeez. He was a big, yeah. tough guy. Uh, you, have, you must have been pretty tough yourself, though, to be able to do well, this. Well, I right? guess I, I must have been. Uh, yes, I, I, think, I think that's no question about that. Uh, this suit, uh, I, they can't be at all like, it's dangerous enough with modern equipment, but I'm sure with this kind of equipment, just the fact of going down under the water would have had its kind of dangers. Yeah. What, what, can you tell it me did. about what it was like being in the suit? And what, what well, you, you had to be, they, they warned us that you didn't have to worry about sharks. I don't know if that was true or not. Not in the Potomac, anyway. Huh? But they did say to be careful of the manta rays because they would swim into the lifelines and then follow them down to the diver for some reason. Huh. And, uh, you know, the experience of that fellow that was the uh, fellow from Australia. The crocodile hunter. Yes. Crocodile hunter yes. Steve was Steve killed Steve with yes. the stinger of yes. the uh, yeah. manta rays. So they were apparently correct in that. Well, see, uh, that's another thing that I never thought about, the, 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 the creatures down there getting you. Yeah. I was thinking, the bomb going to blow up, and the suit, I, I, just, I just remember all those stories again that you see on TV, where the air could be cut off, or, you know, yeah. something, there's a leak. Was, was all, were those things really realities? Were those possibilities? Uh, oh, yes. Yeah. Yes, they were. They had, um, you had a telephone that you could talk to topside, and that was the advantage of uh, over the um, I know which, yeah. other scuba uh, kind of a thing. Scuba kind yeah. of thing. Yeah. Of course, they didn't really have scuba then, but they right. had uh, other devices. I know, I know. Right. Yeah. And so it was probably safer in that deep sea suit because you could communicate with the upstairs. They could pull you up. They have the upstairs. ability to pull you up. Then did they have a they line? They could. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Two questions come to my mind on this, mm -hmm. and you might think I'm goofy because again not experienced it i have this image of this old three stooges thing where the guy with a suit actually like blows up from the air too much air okay. could that have happened could, that's could, the big danger could, it could happen reality oh absolutely oh, okay so it wasn't you big. had a control on your belt which was just simply a water valve is what it was and you could turn it off uh -huh. or turn it on and you could regulate the amount of air coming into the suit Okay. In the helmet, they had a chin valve, which looked like a valve in a car, and if you'd bump it with your chin, it would exhaust the air quickly, or if you would wrap your lips around it and pull it in, it would stop all the air from exhausting. So you could lift yourself out of the mud if you got in that situation by simply holding in on the air valve. And turning more air on, you but float, you float yourself out. Yeah, you float yourself out. But if you lose control of the amount of air coming in and coming out, uh, it can fill the suit up, and it'll throw your arms out to the side, and lift the helmet and breastplate off your shoulders, and you can't reach the chin valve anymore to dump the air out. Yeah. 
and you're going to go to the top side as quick as you can, faster than you would think. And that was the second question I was going to and ask. It, and it could explode the suit. Yeah. And you could get the bends from going up too quick. That's what I was going to ask quick. you about. That was the second question you already anticipated. Something about you, yeah. ha can't, you have to come up in the interval. You can't. Stages, exactly. And it was predetermined how m uh, what level you'd come up to and stop and wait okay. for a certain length of time. Yeah. And then you could move up some more. Yeah. And that was to get the uh, nitrogen out of your blood. Okay. And so you had a, so that was another danger, yeah. that obstacle you yeah. faced. Did you ever, did, in your training, did you personally ever have any mishaps besides getting stuck in the mud? You got out of that one all yeah, right. Yeah, out of that one all did, right. Did, did you have uh, another, another diver that was with me uh, did the spread eagle thing yeah. by bumping his air valve and turning it on too much. And he went topside, but we weren't very deep. Okay. Because he had no... Uh, physical uh, harm, they did ship him into Bethesda, Maryland, to the hospital to decompress him. Yeah. But everything turned out all right. Well, that, that's good. But once yeah. again, it just shows the thing. Uh, yeah. And I know that uh, I know that there's another story that I want to make sure we record here, and it, it has to do with uh, your skills, extra, extra skills that the Navy didn't teach you that got you in some... Uh, good favor, good graces with an admiral. Uh, can you tell me that story about your skills as an engraver and how that? Uh -huh. um, admiral Clark, J.J. Clark, was a uh, two-star flag admiral, and he ran out of stationery while we were out dropping bombs. And this is during the Korean War. And this is during the Korean War. And you're on the carrier now. And we're on the carrier. And a lieutenant came to our ordnance shack one night and says, uh, I heard that there was an engraver here. And I put my arm up and he says, I said, what do you need? And he said, well, he says, how would you like to do a favor for the admiral? He said, he's out of stationery. The, sta the uh, print shop can print him the stationery, but we don't have an admiral's flag to print. So I said, well, maybe I could make you one. So I made this little brass. I'm going to hold this up here. I don't know if uh, the camera will pick it up. Plate but, uh, that yeah. would uh, yeah. would print a uh, two-star flag for the Admiral. Yes, that, and, that's, and that's neat. And I, I did that with my skills learned uh, on the GI Bill. That, uh, that was in the interim. Uh, and so the yes. Navy got another bonus from you, uh, yes. calling you back in. Yes. How did the Admiral react? Did you ever get a chance to talk to him well, about this little favor you did for him? The Lieutenant took me up one evening to flag plot, and I talked to the Admiral, and we had quite a conversation. And <coughs> he said that um, he didn't have an engraver on his staff, and uh, he could sure use one. I said, well, Admiral, I said, I'm sorry, I was just married two months ago, and, and all I can think about now is getting this tour over with and going home. So he said, I understand. Yeah, well, I'm glad he did. I'm glad also the lieutenant gave you the credit. Sometimes in the service, uh, as you go yeah, up the chain the of command, <laughs> uh, they lose sight of who below them is yeah. something. So that was good. So that was, that. It was quite a thrill for me. Oh, yeah. You know, uh, then, highlights of my life. Well, I think you did him a, Meet you did him a favor, too. We have another little artifact here that I'm very fascinated by, the Zippo lighter. Now, I know a lot of uh, men in the service during all the wars have carried these Zippo lighters, but this one has a particular story that I'd like you to share with us. Well, this one I, I had engraved with my name and my rate, my service number, and... Um, you did the engraving yourself. I did the engraving, and... Um, I have the ordnance bomb on here, and it says Korea 1951, and uh, it says VF 874, and then there's a little picture of our squadron insignia was a um, Grandpa Pettibone was flying a, uh, uh, a gull wing plane, which was an F4U, but it was also a coffin. And on the back of it was a wreath, and on the wreath it said WDV. 
And uh, when the um, when that was sent into the Bureau of uh, whatever in Washington for approval, they wanted to know what WDV meant. And uh, the story behind that is we had another squadron in our air group, and they said they were they called them the Volunteer Squadron. And the WDV, uh, they told the Bureau that that meant waste, destruction, and violence. But to us, it meant we didn't volunteer. That sounds good. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you'd think by, that the service would, would catch on, that mm -hmm. the enlisted men and, and people know about ways of getting around all these kind yeah. of things by now. And you lost this, this uh, didn't you? Mm -hmm. at one point in your in one point in your career. I lost that in Tokyo. Uh-huh. And a couple of weeks later came a heavy envelope for me from some lieutenant on a destroyer. And he had found it on the street in Tokyo and with all the information on the lighter he mailed it back to me. That is really neat. That is really neat. I know that uh, 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 different <coughs> organizations are now collecting these from servicemen mm -hmm. over the years and, and putting together neat little stories mm -hmm. and histories like that. And you have yours to pass on to your family. That is great. So you're out of the, you're out of the service now. Uh, you're, you're back home. You get mm -hmm. discharged, right? You're out in California. Uh, mm -hmm. And tell me then what happens. Uh, what, what do you do then? Well, we, we drove back home. Your wife's still living out there? She left yeah. out there for that nine months? No, Wait. no, no. She drove back home by herself. Oh, okay. And then she got in the car when I sent her a Tokyo a letter, a telegram from Tokyo, meet me in December, in December the 17th in San Diego. She jumped in the old Mercury and back out to San Diego, <laughs> and she was waiting for me when the ship pulled into the harbor. That must have been a sight. Yeah, it was. You. It uh, was a great, a great real, time. Oh, yeah, yeah. So you're reunited, mm -hmm. and you just signed the papers, and you're out in a few days mm -hmm. after that. Yeah. Drive back home? Then we drove back home. Your always intent was to make your home back yeah. here in the Mon Valley? Yeah, I got, got a job down at the Lockfold Paper Box Company uh, making dyes. Where's that at? Lockfold Paper Box Company oh, okay. in Charleroi. Okay, good enough. Making dyes. And I made the dyes for the cutting, cutting boxes, like for beer cans, yeah. carriers. Okay. And... Um, I did that for probably maybe a year, maybe more than a year. And then I went into business for myself. I, I bought a dry cleaning business, a uh, pickup route, did that for a while. Then I bought a, a carpet cleaning business, and I did that for 51 years. With Dorothy's help, we, the two of us went out and cleaned carpets and furniture for 51 years. And we retired uh, in, it's been two years now. <laughs> you worked up there. You were 78? Well, yes. Uh, uh, yeah, and you were, I think you're pretty, still That's pretty right. tough then. That's, That's right. Great. That's great. Any children? We have uh, four children. Oh, okay. Two boys. They're twins. Uh, they were born in 1959. Okay. And two girls. And they aren't twins. <laughs> And uh, seven grandchildren. That's nice. So you you got. All, have you told them all these stories? Yes. I, well, I now have. we're going to preserve it, and, and they'll be able to say their grandchildren can can go look at. Uh, That'll on, be this great. All it is going to be, it'll, and they're going to enjoy seeing this and and hearing. Now, I, did any of your children follow you into the service? Did any of? No. No. But my my oldest grandson. Yes. Stephen Hoke. Okay went to uh, West Point, and he graduated from West Point. Uh, it must be fun at the Army-Navy game every year where you two oh, are yes. the opposite sides <laughs> yeah. of the coin now. You're yeah. <laughs> <coughs> well, his other grandfather was, went to Annapolis. All right. Okay. He didn't graduate, but he went there. Okay, so that, that, that's good. So and he, he, uh, he does what now, your grandson? What, uh, he's, well, in, he's in the he Army, but... he went to uh, flight school. And he is flying Black Hawk helicopters. Well, that part of the tradition is carried through your mm -hmm. association with uh, aircraft and, yeah. and military aircraft. Uh, you must be very proud. I am. And I'm sure they're very proud of you. I'm sure they're very proud of you. Now, 
I'm curious, were you able to ever use your engraving skills? I know you did it for your buddies in the service mm -hmm. and you saved the Admiral there with you. Mm -hmm. Were you able to use that, your engraving skills after you've been out of the service? Where did you do that at all? Did you mm -hmm. continue that uh, skills in engraving? I, I've done it for my family, for my boys and, and myself. We, yeah. Very little for pay. Well. Uh, but I engraved guns. Oh, okay. well, that goes way back. Handguns and rifles and okay. things like that. Put scrolls on them, pictures on them. So you're leaving a legacy of your artwork out there, too. Yeah. yeah. That, that's good. Have you been able to continue hunting now? You oh, yeah. still continue mm -hmm. to do that? I still hunt. That's good. Any other hobbies? Anything that you No. Well, yes, I, I do. I shoot pistol. Okay. Get down to Monongah Hill at a sportsman's okay, club. Okay, yes, I know. And I shoot bowling pins. Two I nights saw, a week. I read that in the paper the other night. They were going to have a bowling pin shoot. And I, and we do it. that twice a week. We got 30, 30 or 35 shooters. That's, well, you're keeping it's active. Fun. And it's you're fun. keeping active. Now, I need to, we need to comment, of course, on this nice uniform you have on. Mm -hmm. you, uh, you, whenever you got out of the service, uh, you joined some veterans groups? Do you, do you well, not, not until just recently. Is that right? I, I kind of steered clear of anything to do with it. And, uh, had, your, had your fill of it? No, I, I really have uh, become more patriotic and I appreciate So many of the veterans that I talk to say that it wasn't this uh, kind of uh, oh, overt patriotism mm -hmm. or just trying to show off. They, they felt it was a job and they went into yep. it. And it's now they're going back and reflecting on their service. Well, what organization is this that you belong well, this to? This is the mid Mon Valley uh, Shipmates. Okay. Uh, based in Monongahela, and there are 63 of us uh, at the present time, and we uh, are looking for new members. And what, uh, what uh, is the eligibility to be in, in the Well, if they've been in the Navy, uh, if they've been in the Coast um, uh, Guard, the Maritime Services. Okay. They can do loan. It, it only costs twelve bucks a year. What do you guys do? And we uh, do the two bell ceremony at funerals. For uh, it doesn't have to be a member; can be anybody that's been in the navy. Uh, and it's a very, very impressive service. Oh yes, very impressive. And um, we do parades. Uh, the uh, Monongahela parades coming up on the tenth of November. Saw that. And uh, so, in other words, funny. here you're con well. That's not that's pre that's pretty significant. You're continuing to serve. You guys are still continuing to do yes. things now for others. Could I ask you? Uh, uh, is it mostly uh, elderly veterans? Are you are you getting uh, uh, many? We young have a few young people. That's yes. a good, that's mm -hmm. a good sign too. Not all old guys. A lot of the uh, and ladies. A lot, yeah, I saw Sally Stevenson's mm -hmm. picture was in the paper just last mm -hmm. night. Uh, she taught up here for a while, and okay. she was one of the people that they interviewed. Uh, she from Monongahela. Uh, yes. Yeah. Um, the uh, uh, one of the one of the things that I talked when I talked to a lot of veterans is many of these men got out and joined the American Legion or the mm -hmm. Veterans of Foreign Wars. You'd be, of course, eligible for both of those organizations. Yeah, I belong to the Legion also. Yeah, uh, but they tell me that in many of the cases it's just an elderly group, uh, you know, mm. and it's probably the same thing like you said. Many maybe these young guys got out and felt the same way you did. Yeah. And don't want to join now. And when and it comes their turn, someday they'll they'll, they'll come back. Finally, again. wake up. Yes, they'll take it. Well, I have really enjoyed this. It's hard to believe the time has passed uh, so quickly while we're talking. Uh, do you have anything that you want to mention that I have overlooked, or mm. any anecdote, or? any story that uh, or any comment that uh, you want to make sure is, is preserved yeah, because uh, I'm putting you on a spot, I know. Yeah. I didn't mean to do it that way. <coughs> but uh, sometimes there, there are some things that, uh, you know, people have thought, and they, uh, I, wish, you know, I wish Dave would ask me that, yeah. or I wish I'd have brought that up, and I want to make sure that there's yeah. nothing that we didn't go over. Dave, I can't think of anything. Well, that's okay. It's further been, it's been fascinating. It's been fascinating uh, hearing all these stories you've had. Uh, some, some great experiences. And thankfully for us, you came through all of this very well. Thank thankfully you. for your grandchildren. And we're going to be able to preserve this. I want to thank you for your service I to your country and your continuing service now through these shipmates. 
and what you've done uh, as a good father and a good grandfather and a, and a, and a businessman in the community. Uh, we really appreciate it. I really want to thank you for coming in and doing this today. Well, I thank you too, Dave. It's been a it's, good experience. Well, it's been fun. It's been fun. Take care now, Jack. We All wish right. you the best of luck. Thank you. Okay.